You can turn your Bibles this morning, if you would. Uh, there's kind of two spots. I'm continuing my series on new wine or old wine. And um, the, the second spot is chapter 2 of John. You can see on the PowerPoint there. And the first spot, though, is Luke chapter 5, which is the, the foundation or basis of this series. So yeah, John chapter 2. But first, in Luke 5, 36, it says, He, Jesus, told them this parable. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. And the religious leaders of the day, they had so many extra rules and laws that they were pouring on their people. Um, for them, everything seemed to be a matter of do's and don'ts, and they imposed those on the Jews. And, and the leaders, the religious leaders, were very religious about these things. But they were not necessarily the things that God had asked them to do in his word. And, and so... To Jesus, the old wine was a picture of a lot of the, these old traditions that they had picked up along the way. Uh, traditions versus the new spirit-filled life. Uh, for Jesus, it was the old covenant versus the new wine, in the, the new blood. Uh, the law versus grace. And here Jesus is comparing the old school of Jewish rules to the new school of a relationship with him. So let's begin with prayer. Father, I pray this morning that, Lord, you might open our eyes to the things of the old school, the things that in the Old Testament they weren't necessarily supposed to be doing. That we'd open our eyes, Lord God, to the relationship that you are calling us to, to the new wine. I pray that you would help us to see that in our verses this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Wednesday morning, or Wednesday, April 20th, 18 days ago, spring has sprung. And um, how many began their spring cleaning already? How many have done the outside, have done the inside, cleaning up, getting everything ship shape for this new spring season? Uh, has anyone mowed their lawn yet? My, my grass is a little bit green, and it's almost there, and so, yeah. Anyways, and so, um, it's definitely time to do that spring cleaning and to, to get all the, the uglies out of the house and to, and to uh, clean up. And this Saturday is spring cleaning for our church, and so please don't miss that. We want to do that together. Um, when we were living in Terrace, um, there was a... I remember there was a fall when we were probably about one in the morning in our bedroom and we're hearing these noises just outside of our bedroom and, and, it, and it sounds like scratching going on. And we're hearing our dog whining and whimpering and wondering what's going on with our dog. Uh, night after night after night this was happening. And there was just these noises out there, and we could not figure out. We would go out there, and we'd look, and we couldn't figure out what the noises were all about. And over some months, we were, we were finding that, you know, the dog food, the dog was taking the dog food and putting it in this corner, in that corner, under couches, over here. Dog, we're finding dog food all over the place, just packed away and, and uh, wondering, how, what's wrong with the dog, and why is the dog doing that? And so, sometime in that winter, um, you know, I had at the back of, this is up in Terrace, I had the, at the back of our, our mobile home uh, was, was a room that I'd kind of set aside. There was a couch in there. Oh, it was full of boxes and junk and all that kind of stuff too. But had a couch in there. It was my prayer room. And, and I would go in there and I'd spend my time with the Lord in the back prayer room. And, and, um, and then over some, that winter, there became a time where... It started to stink in there, right? And I, and I knew it wasn't me leaving a stink in there, so that was good. But there, it started to smell. And 
That smell began getting worse and worse and worse. And we went through that room. We, we, we looked through that room. We couldn't figure out what the smell was till finally we had to take towels and stick them under the door so that the smell would not come into the house, the rest of the mobile home. It was, it was awful. It was strong. And so come springtime, um, Connie is, is uh, doing her spring cleaning. She's, and she's gone. She, you know, the, the idea was let's go through the room and get, let's get the smell out of there. And so she's gone through every box and everything. And, and she's opened up the hide-a-bed that, I, that my couch where I would sit and pray. And she's opened up that hide-a-bed. And there, uh, sure enough, there was the smell. It was a pack rat. And this pack rat had gotten up through our vents and, and had, had gnawed away at the side and, and was able to crawl through and get into the house and was stealing the dog food and putting it all over the place. There was a whole bunch of dog food all in that, uh, in that couch. And anyways, when she opens it up, and you know the, the, the metal, um, uh, the fold-out arms of a hide-a-bed, you know, the metal on the side? Well, as she unfolds that, she sees the dead rat. And it's dried out, it's no more, um, but it's there. And, and she gives me a call on the phone, I'm out with a young man from the church, and we come over there together, and she's freaking out, there's a rat in, in our bedroom, right? And, and it wasn't me. And um, anyways, and so we come in, and she, you know, pointing, it's there, you take care of it. And, and I guess what had happened was, when, one, at one point when I sat down to, on the couch to pray, uh, I would have squished it, right? And, you know, and then it was dead, and then it was dehydrating, all, oh yeah, it was not good. It was a smell of death in there. And uh, anyways, so, this, so me and this guy, Mike, we, we go over to clean up the rat. And, and, you know, I'm looking at it. I'm just, you know, having fun. So I'm not touching it, you know. And Mike goes, oh, I'll do it. And he goes and grabs it by the tail, right. And he kind of to Connie like this, you know, and it, right. And, and uh, she's, she's run out of the room already. She's down the hallway. And then Mike stands at the end of the hallway so she can see. And then he holds the rat over his mouth, like this, and it fell, no, just, <laughs> he was safe, he did it all right. And, you know, spring cleaning has to be done. Today's story, Jesus is sick of the mess that is in the temple, and he begins his house cleaning of his father's house. Uh, Jesus clears the temple courts is the passage that we're going to look at in John 2, chapter 13. If you have that in your Bibles, it should be on the board there. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, the Passover celebration happened every year. It was a celebration of, if you remember back about 1,500 years earlier, uh, the, the Jews are in Egypt, they're slaves, and they are to... Um, sacrifice the Passover lamb, and then, uh, you know, the, the blood on the doorposts and all that kind of stuff, and then they, they leave Egypt at that point. But they're to celebrate that every year for the next 1,500 years until the cross. So when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves and other, others sitting at tables exchanging money. And so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle chased them out. He scattered the coins of the money changers. He overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. When Jesus entered those temple grounds, he entered that outside court, the court of the Gentiles, the, um, these temple grounds where, where Gentiles would come. Uh, they were allowed in there. They were allowed to do their shopping in there. They were allowed to come and pay homage to the God of Israel. They, um, they, they could even just be there to come and satisfy their curiosity of what goes on with these Jewish people. But they weren't allowed to go any further than the court of the Gentiles. In the court of the Gentiles, the Jews had set up a marketplace, a mall of sorts, where all manner of sacrificial animals and offerings could be purchased. And then we see Jesus coming in, and he 
is mad. And, and, and the question is, what made Jesus so mad on that day? Right? We, we never really think of Jesus in that way as, as getting mad, and yet he was mad on that day. You know, in our home, Connie, in the past, not now, but in the past, uh, you know, has been known to get a little bit mad. Mad at me, mad at the kids for the messes that we leave all over the place. And, um, you know, messy rooms and stuff lying around. And, you know, and, you know it, locked in our brains is especially this one story, you know, where, where our son Matt right there um, would, leave, would leave one sock, one sock on the family room floor, at, you know, regularly, uh, daily, a couple times a day. And one sock, and she would come in, and she would see that sock, and Matthew pick it up, and, and right. And, and one day, M Mama Bear had enough, and uh, and and she looks him in the face, and she's pointing him, and she's got this ugliness on her face, um, and says, "You clean that up right now." And he just looks at her with this big smile on his face, and says, "Gear down, big rig." Gear down, right? And and Matt has this way of of softening things, and Connie couldn't handle that, and she had to turn away and and big smile on her face, you know, didn't want him to see that. And gear down, big rig. I wonder what Jesus had seen that day that caused him so much righteous anger for him for, for this anger to rise up within him. You know, Jesus had seen the money changers in the temple from birth, right? For, for 30 years already, uh, he's been watching the money changers. And, um, you know, I would think that more than just, you know, seeing these regular things in the temple, he would have been way more ticked off with some of the religious leaders that the things that they were doing even in public and, and that he would have maybe blown up at them at different times but for some reason, here, he lashes out in such force. And he's lashing out against the business people in the temple. He, these business people are actually doing a service for those who come to worship at the temple. This is Jesus' first time to cleanse the temple. How many, how many know that Jesus cleansed the temple twice? Right? And... Um, this is his first time cleansing the temple. In this first time, he had just done the, 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 the wedding of Cana. He had, he had uh, turned water into wine. He had done that miracle. And the next thing we see in the book of John is he's, he's walking into the temple and he's clearing out the temple. And he makes a whip and he chases everything out. He says, my house is meant to be a house of prayer. A place to worship, to, to meet with God, um, God's people meeting together, hearing his word, making sacrifice, having the priest sprinkle blood from your sacrifice, sprinkle it on you, having the priest sprinkle blood on all the things in the holy place, and, um, and cleansing the temple. But the problem with these businessmen, those who ran the tables and who bought and sold sacrificial merchandise, somehow they had lost their reverence for the temple and, they, and, and, and what the temple actually stood for. And they turned something sacred and beautiful into a money-making scheme that took advantage of anyone who came into the temple area. Looking at that court of the Gentiles... You know, Jesus walks in and he's very upset. Was it wrong for those who owned the shops to be there to supply the needs of those who came to worship? Was it wrong to set up shop? Was it wrong to change money over from the, from the Roman currency to the Jewish currency? Probably not. So what was it then? That was so wrong, that made him so upset, 
that he walked into his father's house, the place that should be called the house of prayer, to worship and gather together. What, 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 what was it? And, and I think the best thing I can come up with is the love of money. And we call it the root of all evil. And, um, and, and Jesus was seeing it found in, inside his father's house. They loved the huge profits from the sale of the sacrificial animals and the offerings and the, the changing of money from the Roman currency to Jewish. And the problem what was going on here was that they were price gouging. You know, it's, um, the people had to come from afar and uh, some people that were close could bring their own lamb in for the sacrifice. But most people had to come and just buy their sacrifice there exchanged their money there, and these, and these people were, were, uh, were gouging everyone who came by. These people were to be people that were try, should be helping the worship of God's people, but instead, they were making it ugly. How many here remember Hurricane Harvey from about a year and a half ago? Um, you know, there was reported many stories of price gouging. You know, when, when different catastrophes go on, you, you have all kinds of people. You have people that will do their best to help as much as they can. And that you have other people that are going to do their best to gouge and to make a profit from your circumstances. And so in Houston, Texas, uh, cases of water were going for as much as $100 a case. Uh, gas stations were tripling and quadrupling their prices. Plywood used to, to close up the windows and the doorways and things like that. Uh, batteries that you would need for emergency things. Candles for emergency times. Uh, trip, tripling and quadrupling in price. People were paying premiums for these things. And now they have kind of passed a law that you can be fined major if you're caught doing that. When we went on our holiday in Rome, I remember we, uh, we, we, we had been up for, I think, 36 hours by the time we actually got to our hotel. And, we, oh, we were tired and, and uh, a little bit beside ourselves. And we get to our hotel and we book in. Yes, your room is ready for you. And so the porter takes us up three flights of stairs and we get to our door. He opens up the door and lets us in. And so I go in and put our luggage down and... Somebody else's luggage is in there. And we're thinking, what's up with that? And I look around and I open up the closet and there's their money belt is sitting there on top of the safe. And I'm thinking, score? <laughs> yeah. And we're thinking, what's happened? Like, is this someone else's room? Does, does someone else have a key and they're coming back? And, you know, we, and so we, we complain, we run downstairs and we complain that this room is occupied, and they didn't speak English. They, right, we're in Italy, and and uh, so hard communicating. But they finally came up with us and saw, and oh no 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 problem no problem. We'll just take that stuff down. Well, we we knew right there and then that somebody had probably been murdered and thrown into the dumpster, and that you know they forgot to take these things out, and and uh, our minds were going a little bit crazy because. You know, and they still gave us that room. And we're thinking, who has a key that's going to come in? And, you know, you're thinking that all week long. It, where did this person go? How, who would leave without their luggage and their money belt? And um, anyways, it was our imagination. Nobody was murdered as far as we know. But that was the beginning of the trip to Rome. And... Uh, and so we, then we were leaving from that hotel to go to our, um, to do, go to our cruise, uh, doing a Mediterranean cruise for two weeks. And so we had to go from Rome to Civita Vecchia, which is about, I think, an hour away or 100 kilometers away, something like that. And so when we booked our trip, our cruise gal in Prince George said, hey, um, you're going to want to pre-book your trip from Rome to Civita Vecchia. Uh, 100 kilometers away because it's hard to get there. And so it's only going to cost you $200 to, to go this, this trip. And we thought, you know, we're well-traveled. We uh, are somewhat. And 
we, we're, we're big people. We can handle ourselves. And so, you know, we, we read online that you can just take a train, and the train's cheap. And so we decided we're going to go the cheap way. And so that was good. So we're in our hotel, and we're exiting the hotel, and they're saying, oh, no, no, you should take a taxi at least because it's hard to get to Civitavecchia to your cruise line and at least take a taxi, and that's only $140. And we thought, oh, no, we know better. And so we took a little taxi into town and to the train station, and we had read online that from the train station, you can go from there for six bucks a person for this little train ride. And uh, we thought we'd do that. And so we get there, and there's like tracks and tracks and tracks, probably 10 trains leaving at the same, same time. And, and um, you know, we, we stood in front of this one train thinking it was it, and that it wasn't it. And then we went to another one, and we were thinking, oh, this could be, this could be terrible, right? Can we actually get all of our luggage? Because we, you know, Connie had like a stack like this, and I had my little one. And, and, um, and we thought, can we get it all on? And people are lining, crowds of people are lining up. And, and then it turns out that there was just the two of us that walked on the train. The train was empty. And uh, so we put our stuff down. And then we started wondering, is this actually the right train? Because there's nobody on here. And eh, within 10, 15 minutes, the rest of the people came. And, and we got the best seats there. It took our hour trip. It was a two-block walk to our ferry. And it was perfect, right? But... People, to give you a little bit of, uh, um, what would I call it, um, convenience or peace of mind, will offer you exorbitant rates for something that you can do for as little as $6, right? $200 or $6. And, and they're, they're, they're looking to make their money and they're looking to make it well, too. And um, most people pay those expensive rates, just for that peace of mind and convenience. So when Jesus, Jesus walked into the temple and these people were there to help you to worship, he was mad and ticked off because they were just overcharging people to come and worship God, his Father. Price gouging going on. It was as though people had to buy the blessings of God and the right to worship him. It's no wonder he became so angry. But people in Jesus' day, they were just fine paying that extra $200 or extra $140 for the taxi or however much amount. They were just used to it. It was uh, like we've talked in some weeks past about the old wine and new wine. Um, the people that were used to the old wine liked it better even though the new wine was way more better for them. That didn't sound right, but better for them. And the old wine in this case was the old temple that had had its day already, and now a new temple was in order. You know, even in the Old Testament, the temple had to be cleansed regularly. People would make sacrifices, the priests would come in, they would, they would take the blood and the blood would be splashed on the, on the altar and the blood would be splashed on the people and the blood would be splashed on the, on the furniture and stuff that was inside of the temple and it was cleansed on a regular basis. The temple always needs to be cleansed and it needs to be cleansed over and over and over. And here, Jesus comes in and he cleanses the temple himself. And then this is at the beginning of his ministry. And then three years later, he comes in again and does it again. Blood has to be spilled and sprinkled for the cleansing. In John 2, 18, it says, The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. In our story, Jesus 
is at the beginning of his ministry, going into Jerusalem, going in during, at the beginning of the Passover, knowing what's been happening for 1,500 years of, of sheep being, uh, of lambs being slaughtered uh, to cover their sin, to remember what had happened in Egypt. And this is the Passover that he's walking into. This is the temple that he's walking into. And as he's walking into this, he is looking forward to the cross, looking forward to his death. And that just, looking forward, you know, when I think of me looking forward to something, it's a good thing, right? But Jesus is looking ahead. He is looking. He knows what is coming. Uh, he had stated it in those verses that we read that, that he is saying, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He, he knew exactly what was coming three years down the road from here. He knew that in that short time, in those three years, he was one day going to be riding in on a colt into Jerusalem to freely give his life to purchase the souls of men at no cost to them as he is looking at these money changers and, and making it hard to worship God in, in God's house, comparing the two. You know, the Old Testament temple had to be cleansed with blood. And that blood was just a temporary cleansing. The New Testament temple, Jesus cleansed it two times over in his ministry there. And that wasn't enough. But then Jesus went to the cross, shedding his blood that we might be cleansed with his blood. A final washing. When Jesus died on the cross, and when we invite him into our hearts, he sprinkles his blood over, the, over our minds, over our hearts, over our bodies, over our thoughts, over our ideas. We, we are cleansed like the Old Testament temple, every piece of furniture that's in the house. Um, he cleanses everything. And sometimes in our lives, we don't open every door to him. And we say, I, I don't know if I want you to step into that room and, and throw some blood on that and cleanse that one because I've kind of enjoyed that a little bit and I'm going to hold on to that. And yet Jesus says, hey, my blood is the power of your salvation and you can, you can have salvation even in that room. Every part of you cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Hebrews 9.11 says, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Jesus came to sprinkle his blood over us that our consciences might be cleansed. You know, at, at, at the cross, when we, when we come to the cross and we bow a knee before him and give our lives to him, there's that initial cleansing and, and he will come in and he will do such a work and he will change your life and, and, and give you the most awesome life you can ever imagine. But then there's always a few doors that still need to be opened and he'll come in and clean those as we open them up to him. This morning, what does Jesus need to cleanse in your temple right now? Is there a door that's being closed in your house, in your heart? You know, the Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, he died, he, he closed down the other temple and he made us his temple. 
And as his temple, he comes and lives inside and he says, I want to be the master of your life. I want to be the Lord of your life. I want to give you the most amazing life that you can ever have. What does Jesus need to cleanse from your temple right now? 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. If our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, then that means whatever there is that is hanging on to our lives that's displeasing to God makes us no better than those money changers or the shopkeepers in the old temple. If we're hanging on to stuff, putting stuff before God, we're no better than them. I want to call our worship team to come. I also want to call our communion team to come. And as we go to the communion table today, you know, the Bible says we need to examine ourselves. All those rooms on the inside, all those things that we might put up before God. Um, Is there something that Jesus needs to clean in your temple right now? I wonder, I wonder, as we go to the Lord's table in communion, Jesus is in the temple. You are God's temple. And he lives there. And and yet living there, you know, just like in the old temple, he he was in that old temple for 30-some years, 30, right? Day in and day out, seeing the money changes and all that, and then suddenly he's cleaning up. And I wonder this morning, he, he, if, if you're a, a child of God, like the song sang, we sang earlier, I'm a child of God. If, if we are a child of God, he's there inside, but we still need to clean up. There's still things that we hold on to. And I wonder if Jesus, walking around inside your temple, at this communion time, if he would come and suddenly grab that communion table inside of you and knock it over and say, there's something wrong in here. I don't know. That's between us and God, right? Jesus says, when you come to this communion table, check on the inside. Confess your sins. And he will be faithful to forgive us the sins. His blood covers that. We get to go to God and his blood covers it. It's, he, he did the work for us. Would Jesus throw over your table this morning? The Bible says examine ourselves as we go to the communion table. And the Bible also says, if, you know, if you're not a born again believer, if you haven't bowed a knee to Jesus Christ, please don't partake in this communion little meal that we take here. Um, it's for, for those that say yes to Jesus. And um, he says, even for, the, even for the believers, we can take this meal in a wrong way. And if we do that, he, the Bible says that some people get sick. Maybe that's what I'm sick. I don't know. I'll have to check that out. We um, need to examine ourselves. That's what some people are, even die because we take communion wrongly. We, we don't examine ourselves. So I'm just going to have you all bow your heads this morning. And maybe you're not a believer in Christ today. And you say, Pastor, I, I would like to know this God of yours. He says he would love to come into your life through his son, Jesus Christ, coming in and being your Lord. And, and if that's you this morning, that you want to start a relationship with Jesus that's you, just quickly raise your hand. No one's looking around, and, and I'll just pray quickly to have him fill you up. Amen. So I'm assuming that everybody knows the Lord this morning. And so he says, even for the believer, you need to check your heart. Get cleansed. Cleanse the temple. We need to do that on a regular basis every time we have communion. And so, Lord, I pray this morning. You'd show us any areas in our temple 
where we've been disobedient, where we're not serving you properly. Lord, if there's any tables that need to be turned over, I pray that you turn them over right now. Open up those doors. Show us those things that we need to address. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.